So does anyone know, um, I didn't know this actually, what the definition of adolescier is? The Latin root of adolescent medicine, I guess, or adolescence. So as uh, depicted in this picture, it means to mature or grow into maturity. So it's, it's quite interesting. And I start with this because it's such a, like, it's such a critical thing to remember when we're dealing with adolescents that they are, again, like the two to four year old, just these rapidly developing beings uh, that are so plastic and we could really, you know, not maneuver with them. I don't want to say like do, you know, but there's so much room to make a difference and, but so much room for adverse outcomes if they're exposed again and again to negativity or negative influences. So just like these seedlings kind of represent that you could have the exact same DNA with different environments, you'll you can become a very different tree. Um, so just to put it into a, a bit of a context, the cases are very generic um, on purpose just to open the idea. So yeah, don't tell RAMQ if you're, you're trying to do some preventative care. How could you? Um, a 16 year old boy. So you kind of go through the checklist. Nothing much comes up except in heads, he, he vapes weed. So you have to kind of speak with him for a little while to figure out, does that mean once a month or once a week or every hour? What kind of concentration are you using? So especially now when we vaping, we'll talk about it later, but that is a whole other ball game now because you have no idea how much they're getting and really what they're getting. But so I, I found even myself for a long time I started viewing, okay, they smoke a bit of weed here and there, like, could be so much worse, you know, <laughs> you start to look at things like that, especially when you're in tertiary care, and, um, but do we have to maybe think of it a little bit differently? It's so common, and yeah, some people are doing worse, but we have to think about a lot of kids and what it's doing overall. Um, is he trying to treat something that we should have treated? Or is he, I don't even know what I was exactly trying to say with this, but is he um, just liking it and that's the groove he's gotten into and is there room for you to step in but without having to necessarily diagnose something? Um, it, it makes a difference if the parents are aware. Sometimes they are the providers. Sometimes they have no clue, anything in between. And it makes a difference. On, your approach and how much time it may or may not take and it, it plays a big role. So at the conference there was a lot of talk about the upcoming data which is pretty new in neuroscience about just exactly how it, marijuana affects the teenage brain and I think it's to a greater extent in a nutshell um, than we even thought. Um, so just to go back a bit to the basic neuroscience, not much in detail, the adolescent brain is designed to adapt to the environment, as I suggested. So, you know, if you're altering what, how your brain is seeing, then that's going to affect how you make all your connections. Um, so you get new myelination, just like a very young child. You're making new pathways and connections, and the ones that are used are going to be the ones that stick. Um, this is a time of maturing of executive function, which is actually like becoming capable of independently doing things. Um, and so when you're exposed to these kind of, op so all the opioid receptors are very much involved in this sense of a reward system you're so much more inclined to be like, oh my God, this feels amazing. I'm going to keep doing it. And you don't yet have that mature brain to be like, okay, this is cool once in a while. So it could be like more, more, more. And so there's just, it amplifies the potential of, of a threat because we're not always uh, using the substance in moderation. Um, so just so you remember the endocannabinoid system has receptors all throughout the brains and actually I didn't even realize the extent to which it really controls um, 
all of the other neurotransmitters. So when we think about our serotonin, our dopamine, which are so key, you know, the list goes on, but so key for so many uh, problems that we, we try and treat and avoid pathology in, the, the cannabis is really touching on all of those and um, it's important to remember. So some of the new studies, and I, I don't have all the, the resources here, but I could give you them if you're interested. Um, so overall, there are both functional and structural changes to the brain shown on imaging of, of teenagers with marijuana use. And all of these effects are amplified with how frequently you use, the concentration, um, and the age of first use is really key. So there's actually also though some data suggest that the structural changes aren't only a, an outcome of using heavy using, but that you could have structural uh, differences in the people that are m more prone to start be using and becoming heavy users. So you can imagine how difficult it is to to pick apart that those. Um, that data, but it's very interesting. So there is a small, but it is significant effect on IQ and most importantly in learning. And what is a teenager needing to do? At, they need to learn, otherwise it's gonna affect the rest of their life. So even if you can argue like, oh, but they'll recover. Uh, if they're not learning in those important years, you know, between 12 and 18, well, they're setting themselves up for a poor socioeconomic status, poor job attainment and retention, etc. So, it's pretty. Um, it's pretty important. Uh, there's also from the general population, two to four times the risk of psychosis, and obviously the most again with heaviest use. But especially, and this is where you can use certain individual traits when counseling patients, um, especially if there's any family history or uh, of psychosis, schizophrenia, for example, or a lot of childhood trauma. So those people are, you know, it's probably way over four times the general population risk of developing psychosis with heavy use of marijuana. 70% um, of those using it as the first drug, we'll use another illicit drug within six years. So we used to say, oh, it's not really a gateway drug. No, 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 people are exaggerating. It actually, it is for many complicated reasons. Um, but the risk really decreases if you could put off that first use until later, probably because their executive functioning and thought processing has matured at least a little bit and the risk factors for them having started young are obviously not there. Um, yeah, it also obviously associated with the higher risk of substance use dis disorder, so where it actually becomes a functional impairment. So yeah, we don't need to be experts knowing every single tidbit of information, but it's good to kind of arm yourself with, with legit up-to-date data because kids are, are researching themselves, you know? Like the, we can't assume teens are just completely naive and they, they're completely risk averse. It's not, or I think I just mixed up how I said that, that they're completely you know, not aware of any risk, but um, so they're reading too and we have to be able to have that conversation with them. And it's actually very important to kind of invite them to, to have this conversation because as soon as you just determine that you're in that role and you have the right to, to say like, you know, weed's not good for you and however you, <laughs> you're gonna say it, they're gonna shut off and it's bye-bye and okay, 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 thanks. Um, so you've gotta really level at them and see if they wanna talk about it because if they're that pre-contemplative that they, they don't wanna hear it, they're not gonna listen to you um, and they'll really feel much more respected if you kind of ask them if they're okay just to, to chat about it, most will be. Um, 
personalize, like I mentioned, the family history, let's say, of psychosis. If they had somebody in their family who, who had schizophrenia or somebody who died of a drug overdose, or, and hopefully, especially as family practitioners, you, would, you might have that information about the patient or the family, uh, you could really use it to your benefit and not in like a <coughs> accusatory way, but just like, look, I'm really worried about you because this is really even that much more of a risk for you. Um, blanket statements do not work, especially with the older patients. They'll write you off as, you know, citing a textbook and you got to at least be able to pretend to have the conversation as somebody who's a little bit out there. Um, so, and also acknowledging their beliefs, and they gave some really good examples at the conference, or experts in this area. Um, so if you really try and get into the thought process of, okay, this 16-year-old this is not just being completely haphazard with himself. He cares about his future. He's not, you know, um, but to him, he kind of weighed the pros and cons, and he's like, this makes me feel better. This helps me focus in school and that's something I've been struggling with a lot why why would I give it up so if you don't get to that you're not gonna get through to him and if if you say like listen like you have really good insight you actually kind of figured out what your issue was and you're trying to treat yourself that takes a lot of brains it takes you know a lot of <laughs> executive functioning um, but can I just, can you hear me out as to why there might be a better way and why the overall negatives may come to outweigh the positives that you're seeing? Um, we see you and hear you, you know, in, in all different ways to show that based on your relationship with the patient and the individual patient. Um, yeah, and, and I find it super important now to just be like, I get it, everything is messed up right now. We've all been through the worst, and especially you guys as teenagers, like it's just unprecedented and we can't fully understand, but we still have a future to work towards. Can we try and navigate it together? Um, yeah, so just a few other little points to m try and motivate, even just to consider change. You are making a difference if you just do get their wheel spinning because they will go home and think about it if you didn't let them just shut off by lecturing them um, and again going back to to the adolescent brain using something very factual not like not weeds gonna hurt you like your brain is growing really fast and it's trying to be more efficient cannabis is shown directly to to affect this um, and I think you want your brain to work effectively um, and yet yeah, offer other strategies. So don't just say it's not a good way to treat your attention deficit or your sleep problems. Actually say we're gonna make a plan and, and look into how you can better help them with whatever they were struggling with. Um, and then any minimal change, even if they reduce by 5%, 10%, congratulate it and say it's a good, it's a good start. Um, yeah, sometimes actually being the one to challenge them with that small but attainable goal could really get them on board to, to work with you. Yeah, so share the facts. The drug supply is tainted with fentanyl. That's something that unfortunately now I'm going to share widely because it's the truth, as scary as it is. I think that message of saying like that it's now that one party that, that is killing people. It, it's just really, really frightening. Is that a reality in Canada I, as well? I don't think the numbers are nearly where the U.S. is, but you have to just assume that sure. the, it's spilling over. But I didn't get good data on that note. We just don't also have the same numbers. But, but yeah, I know in, in Ontario there was a big uh, drug seize that that was tainted with fentanyl and there were definitely pockets of deaths, but I don't know the numbers. Um, yeah, you can't smell it or see it, but it can kill you in small amounts. And another little tidbit for teens that could often kind of motivate them or persuade them is you, you don't just get arrested for driving under the influence of alcohol. 
And so they're deadly afraid of losing their licenses and it doesn't take much for them to lose it at that age. So it'd be like you could you know, have a puff of a joint as a 16 year old, if you're pulled over and that's in your system, you can forget your license. That can, can help, obviously round it out with other stuff. Um, edibles also, like um, you had mentioned, are, are very hard to, to know the concentration for. So people can get very, very sick. I don't know about deaths, but you can get severely poisoned from high doses in foods because you basically put the marijuana in a butter or an oil and then you have no idea how it's dispersed from one brownie to the next or whatever it is. Um, oh yeah, and tell enabling parents that a teen brain is not an adult brain because often you'll see those parents just trying to, you know, they're trying to navigate and be like this, it could be much worse and I do it anyway, so better I, you know, say, I'll share it with you rather than them having this is their argument, let's say, than having them go get it themselves and, and doing other dangerous things. But they really need to understand that what might not harm them so much can really harm the adolescent at a different level. And these years are just very precious and fragile. So to come into the next topic, that 13 year old girl just generalized difficulties. So this is just to show that it could be like anything or everything basically and stuff is just not going well. Mom explained she's progressively more fearful, having a hard time since school resumed post pandemic, socially and academically, a little bit of everything. Um, yeah, there's a family history of ADHD. Uh, symptoms do not really predate the pandemic by much though. And this family was particularly hit hard by income loss and isolation. So you'll see my point of kind of presenting it this way soon. How many of us are just tempted to, to narrow in on like, oh yeah, this sounds like ADHD or, you know, we're trying to get through and oh, she must be becoming anxious. The point of this is we have to really make an effort to differentiate and, and myself very much included between a diagnosable, fully criteria fitting DSM disorder and what you could bundle into, let's say, a trauma, a trauma induced set of symptoms, you know, to keep it very vague. So what they would call, yeah, in the States, it's a big thing, trauma informed care. I hadn't heard much of, of that kind of grouping, but it's really, and the reason to differentiate so much is because our treatments are not going to work. And, you know, you bring your efficacy of, let's say, an SSRI for an actual generalized anxiety disorder versus, you know, that whole grab bag of people who are struggling for so many reasons, but that need targeted therapy and, and coping mechanisms. And the efficacy just drops because you're just throwing chemicals at them and it, it's not, you don't have that same biological under pinning of what we think when you're actually meeting criteria. Um, so, and many and most of us experience trauma and adversity, but only a very small minority of those people will develop actual full criteria meeting disorders. But I know we've all been living that in between of like, well, they're, they're struggling so much, they're not functional. How could we not treat them? Like, we're, we can't just send them home. It's really hard. Um, and you also don't want to be saying, oh, you need therapy, but there's a huge wait list for therapy, so sorry. So one big take home message from AAP was a lot of research just showing that very small targeted interventions can make a big difference. So if you think it's something that's more of you know, poor coping and adaptation and a lot of adversity exposure, don't feel like it's not gonna do anything to, to take two minutes and work on breathing techniques or to work on, you know, for a little kid sometimes hugging a teddy bear and closing their eyes and picturing something good. Just that can, can be effective in the moment, make them feel also seen and heard until you can 
help get, let's say, a therapist involved or a social worker and try and make things more organized at home or whatever the underlying factors may be, but th it takes a lot of digging, right? Um, for one child, trauma is, is considered negligible to the next. You know, just them seeing their parents fighting to a sensitive child is w world collapsing, whereas the next one really can endure anything until they are sexually abused, you know? So it's just, Ideally, we have a lot of time to speak to our patients, <laughs> but that's a whole other story. Um, beware of limitations of screening tools. So I mentioned we had Journal Club with the residents, and she did a very good overview, let's say, of the new um, CPS statement about anxiety screening, but it's very much like trying to put something that's not so simple into a few pages of like, do this screening questionnaire and make sure to ask about past medical history and family. Yes, it's, you know, it was pretty well done, but at the same time, these screening tools are just screening tools and you can get a lot of false positives from a screening tool. You have to, there's no way around actually talking one-on-one -on -one and being like, what's going on in your words? Don't just answer all these questions because you could have the exact same score as your neighbor and be experiencing a very, very different reality. Um, and yeah, avoid just trying out a med when the diagnosis is not clear. If you're really questioning it, the chances of the medication being effective is much, much lower, but I'm guilty of, of doing that without being as maybe sure as I'd like to be in certain situations. Um, and yeah, another big thing is avoid moving to a more harmful class when first line doesn't work. So I think this goes especially for anxiety and depression I think I have a slide on it later, but it's basically first line is SSRI, SSRI, SSRI. You try the top three that are very well studied in pediatrics before considering anything else. There's nothing else that comes close in efficacy. So if you rethought your diagnosis and you're sure, you're much better off trying another one rather than being like, mm, maybe we have to go to something like Wellbutrin, which is very rarely at all effective in, in kids. and um, so I think that message is important. Those would be fluoxetine and sertraline and escitalopram. Uh, yeah, take lived experience into account. That's another way of saying trauma-informed care. Otherwise, we'll just keep prescribing. And so you could probably interchange um, what I'm going to say about sleep with screens. I mean, I find screens have become such a moot point that I don't even... Uh, it's so, so frustrating, um, but yes, I agree, and I think I'm supposed to speak about ADHD in a few months, and I think I, I was trying to think of a way to, to make like the ABCs of the approach to ADHD and find a way, instead of airway breathing circulation, to be um, somehow fit in screens and sleep and activity. So activity, and I was thinking, do I do uh, bed rest or, uh, you know, I'm trying to fit it in, but, but because it so is like before any of these screening tools and before anything, and it should be at the forefront of all of our primary care, especially, um, to just get down to the basics because most of the teenagers aren't sleeping nearly enough. Mm -hmm. And I find I'm like a, uh, I'm on repeat every day. Do you know that a teenager should actually get 11 to 12 hours of sleep? I'm not suggesting that you're actually going to get that, but just to give you a really good idea of how six hours is not cutting it. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was nine. I yeah, I was going to say, say yeah. uh, for, was for a teenager, the yeah. ideal oh. Yeah, oh, never is over 11. I know that's and then on the weekend, do their 10 to 11 it doesn't well. it doesn't count. It's the <laughs> ideally the regular circadian rhythm and they're consolidating, so they go back to, it's again like everything we talked about before, they go back to like a toddler's brain that needs that consolidation because they're making new synaptic processes and, and neural connections that need to be yeah, consolidated. Like I know, that's, right. I know, but if the doctor tells you, 
you you actually you should try and get more like eight hours of sleep. You're like, oh, I'm like if I'm getting six. It's really not that bad. Yeah. I just like to share the facts with them that ideally you would be getting up here. I hear you. It's not going to happen, and it's mostly not your fault. But if you can get somewhere between, you're that much better off. And I promise you, you will feel better from whatever you are complaining about. And I will not even consider medication, you know, or, or a diagnosis before any of that. So, so sleep even before screens, uh, to, from what I see. But screens, yes, is a whole other. And they almost yeah, always go together. Not. Yeah, it's almost always the screens getting in the way of the sleep. Yeah. But I think a lot of this is everybody's kind of coming back to the question of how do you empower parents and teens together. Um, it's definitely not, not easy, but uh, what was the big, like I think sometimes what I have to do is put it back into terms for the parents like you know, you're not, you wouldn't not feed your child and it's a basic need and right of care. Like would, you know, would you sooner want to, to see your child going on medication and having years of therapy or can we get back to basic? This is not exactly how I say things, but I'm trying to just put it all together. Like this is critical. It's again, the ABCs. So if we don't get down to basics, you're just going to have problem after problem compiling. So I get that it's really hard, but make it a priority. It, or it's just, you can't get anywhere when they're not sleeping. And yes, screens are usually intertwined in that. You put the screens away and you're like, oh, but I have too much homework. But you're not going to do well in your homework after a certain amount of time when you're not sleeping. And there's always a but, but it's just, it's really a non-negotiable. Um, yeah, and, and I don't think it's right to try and make sense of other issues when, when sleep is an issue. And yes, you can have a primary sleep disorder and it's our job to discern that. Are they having obstructive sleep apnea or an actual parasomnia? But that's the rare, rare majority in teens and you have to just help them get back to actually taking care of their brains. You could be learning as much as you want in school, but if most of it's not consolidated because you're not sleeping, what's the point? And you're almost invariably going to look like you have anxiety and depression and you name it and ADHD. Um, and then, yeah, just a word on de-prescribing because often, you know, if they, especially if kids have been to non-pediatric uh, non specialized doctors, um, like outside of our clinic, we see people come in and they've seen doctors who never see kids and they're put on, on all, sometimes weird medication. You have to think, are these medications causing the sleep difficulties also? Because that, that could be the case in a, few, in a few areas. And sometimes even, let's say, you, you might have to reconsider ADHD treatment. If it, it might be doing a great job with treating ADHD, but if it's absolutely making it impossible for them to sleep, you got to think like, what? what's the bigger problem here? So that's where um, yeah, Ben's nodding his head because there's lots of experience there. And yeah, and so in those ABCs, and I didn't put it directly into this talk, but um, it's definitely activity. The more I see it with my own kids, the more I'm, I'm so, it's so proven to me over and over that they need to be active and get their energy out. Otherwise, of course, course they're going to develop symptoms of ADHD and then <laughs> which usually leads into uh, anxiety and depression and that's a whole other angle of this talk but they need to get that energy out every day and there's going to be every excuse in the book from the parents and it's just like that's the way their bodies are designed and their brains can't function optimally if they don't get the energy out it just it's like a broken record but it, it has to be prioritized and and it's frustrating I want to go to the school boards and I want to go you know to some higher ups and be like you, everything has to change it's just so ridiculous what we are prioritizing and what we're not okay so now just 
and I'm going to, I'll probably have to, sp I don't know what time it is, but speed through this because there's a lot here, but, and I, I spoke to the adolescent group about this more, but for us, I think there's just a few important take home points. So uh, another patient that's over the 99th percentile, BMI, but he's accelerated over the past three years. So um, the parents think something must be explaining it. Um, you know, do you, or do you not open that? Pandora's box. Um, how many of us often really just equate weight gain to calories in, calories out? I think we're all guilty at some point to some extent doing that. Um, and even if like this, this case here is kind of, you know, on the one hand saying like, okay, yes, probably you don't have a dysfunctional thyroid or something diagnosable in that way, but that doesn't mean that it's all about what they eat and how much they exercise. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that. If you have to simplify it like this, yes, but I think we're, we owe to our patients to understand obesity um, on many more deeper levels than that if we really want to actually help the patient. Um, so just a fun fact, doubling of BMI, of the BMI increase rate. So BMI rates were obviously already going way up, especially in North America. Um, there was a doubling of that rate over the pandemic, which I find striking. And so a lot of it they say has to do with human behaviors, obviously stress and so many things, but circadian rhythm was independently found, again, going back to sleep as a key, key issue. And even if you're sleeping the same number of hours, but you're doing it mostly in the morning, then you're messing with all of your hormones and all of your regulation systems and you can eat the same amount and gain a lot of weight. Um, and yeah, so sleep, sleep loss, nighttime eating, you get these leptin increases to just to introduce how complicated it gets. So leptin is one of the big markers um, but a lot of hormones are involved and that increases, you get more insulin resistance, even with the same amount of sugar coming in, um, you get more acanthosis. Like there are so many changes that go on when you're taking the same person, let's say, but just altering their sleep cycles. So I think that's pretty telling and that can maybe help the sleep talk too. Um, and then there's always that other kind of question pulling in our minds is there an endocrine issue going on? And yes, in certain cases you want to rule it out, but it's the rare minority. So just to quickly um, go over which ones I'm talking about. So I talked about that. So it's, it's helpful even if you just change the calories in, calories out to hunger and satiety, that alone gives you more empathy for the patient. So you ha we have to try and understand that some people just really feel this lack of control. They're always hungry no matter how much they eat. And it's still maybe more complicated than that, but at least this is taking kind of the finger away that we're trying to point, which in some ways is, a try is us trying to absolve ourselves of responsibility in a sense. Um, the science is exploding. There are many medications on the horizon, which it's great and terrible at the same time. Um, it's great that that's available, but I think the message generally, especially coming from talks in the States is, is like that um, we can't prevent it. So I have a lot to say about that, but in any case, it's a big problem and it, it's good at least that we have options to help. I just wish we were doing more to stop it first. Um, there's obviously biopsychosocial, um, factors involved and it is a chronic disease. So another big thing that we have to remember is that, you know, it's great to lose weight and, and a lot of people will be capable of losing weight, but somebody who has the disease of obesity is going to struggle every single day thereafter keeping that weight off. And so it's not just lose the weight, you'll be great. Like it's really, really not that simple. And so when you're formulating a strategy, it has to be something that they can actually keep up forever. Um, and so, yeah, I just listed a bunch of, of markers here that are being studied and, and their medications are targeting them, and, um, but we don't need to get into that today. Um, so yeah, I could get into a whole other talk on everything about the drugs and the pathways and receptors, but 
that's for another time. Um, we don't even need to talk about gene testing, like single gene obesity. Uh, that it is so rare. Uh, it's unlikely unless you like stick out of your family. Um, that it's not something that we should generally go searching for from what I understand from so um, yeah and in uh, thyroid I'm guilty of like always checking thyroid function as much as I check <laughs> iron but I, I really sh probably shouldn't be um, unless you really have you're gonna have short stature and height and or height deceleration basically if your weight gain is because of hypothyroid it's really it's not, you're likely, yeah. So the TSH actually increases in response to leptin and it's actually shown that if you, with weight loss, it normalizes, so. But it shouldn't be way, way, way over normal, but a little bit, yes. Um, and actually, you, if you have just obesity without hypothyroidism, which is usually the case, likely you'll have some height acceleration if you're if your growth plates aren't closed. So that could be further proof to use with the parent. Um, buffalo hump sometimes like, will we'll worry because it'll stick out to us and we'll think back to med school, like what's going on? I'm guilty of it too. Um, if you have a normal height acceleration, again, it's very unlikely that you have a steroidal issue um, like Cushing's. Other things, if you have normal BP, if you, don't ha if you're, you have stretch marks but they're not bright purple, um, you don't have these moon faces or anything like that. You could be pretty sure you don't have to go chasing down a Cushing syndrome unless you're talking about maybe a patient who's on steroids for whatever other medical reason, nephrotic syndrome, cancer. Um, and then something that I also, I didn't realize the extent of was how unhelpful random or AM cortisols are. So if you actually ever are really suspecting a problem with cortisol, you really need to do um, a 24 hour, which needs to be done uh, with endocrinology. And an another thing that's also very rare that, you know, you might be flagged to think about uh, is gigantism um, or growth hormone excess. It, basically, you will, like I said, grow faster if you're becoming obese because insulin and, and IGF-1 are, are like cousins, um, but you don't need to think about a growth hormone secreting tumor or gigantism unless you have um, signs of high ICP, visual changes, and if you're extremely tall for the family, also symptoms of diabetes, this is a bit beyond my scope. Um, and then measuring insulin levels or random glucose are also not very useful because they fluctuate a lot within the day and between patients. Uh, fasting glucoses and hemoglobin A1C are much more reliable markers in general. Um, puberty, one point that came up that was a good point is we often forget to ask about it in males. And males with obesity, um, they'll often have hypogonadal, hypogonadism, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, and so they can actually have a delay in progression of their actual puberty, like the growth of the testes. Um, even if they're having lots of adrenarchal features um, and that could be bothering them a lot. And usually you can reassure them that with some weight loss that will actually progress. Um, it's actually kind of the inverse to females in that sense, obesity with puberty, but another whole topic. So weight loss sounds like the you know holy grail and you're promoting it while at the same time, we need to remember that a rapid weight loss can really alter your hormones in a very counterproductive way. And so slow and steady really is more likely to win the race because um, your body just goes, it's very smart and it goes into overdrive to really try and stabilize your weight. It doesn't know what's happening. It doesn't know if you're gonna have food availability, you know, the next month if you're thinking evolutionarily. So <clears throat> any quick changes are very unlikely to be sustainable. Um, yet, of course, we're trying to get a lot of weight off and not have it take forever because all the comorbidities depend on it. So um, if you could think about somehow controlling hunger rather than just purely controlling intake, you're, you're more likely to have to sustainability. And so that's one of the big roles for this new GLP-1 
a receptor agonist, you'll hear a lot about that, um, but it can have its own talk and I'm not the expert on that. But I think we're all gonna have to become comfortable with it in the not too distant future. Uh, the holistic approach always important. Again, structured sleep and eating and activity, trying to get that as a, a habit and a pattern to actually have a chance. Um, and sleep, sleep and weight go hand in hand again. Um, yeah, so just a word on bariatric surgery is actually like it's more effective than I even realize, and to the point that the AP now accepts it as the main category of treatments. And oh, just a couple of quick hits that are very practical. So there's been a lot of <clears throat> suggestion of this, I know, at conferences recently, but now it's really kind of hitting home and there's new reports about to come up about official guidelines that iron dosing is ideal once a day and not multiple times a day because you have this hepcidin spike that really decreases absorption for at least 24 hours. And so you're, <clears throat> you're being counterproductive by dosing multiple times a day. You're you get less time, absorption. Ideal time of day? That was not discussed, no. But I imagine it'll be in the AAP report that they uh, said would come out at the end of this year even. So for teens and like even 12 Everyone, years. yeah. Um, and that even lower doses <clears throat> could be more effective than very high doses, but I don't have the details on that. I don't have the per kilo doses. Um, breast pain, so is a common concern. Uh, it's really cancer, which is so rare to begin with in a teenager, is not going to present with, with breast pain. I mean, you know there's always exceptions in medicine, but it's basically that's not going to be how it, that rare case would present. Um, to just, but that's what the people are afraid of, that's what the teen's afraid of as soon as anything's hurting them. In the breast area, they think they have breast cancer and you've got to get them out of that rabbit hole. Um, and so we used to say that caffeine could promote a lot of breast pain, but that's actually not been, um, there's very little evidence for that. Uh, there's better evidence for OCP if it's, it's um, affecting their impairment, a s good support bras and smoking cessation, marijuana or cigarettes. <clears throat> and then one thing that I learned about that causes no, 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 no. It that it helps. Okay. Yeah, because okay. with smoking you get okay, okay. Um, myocarditis in teens, uh, the ejection fraction, and so like their cardiac output and the whole cardiac exam is very likely to be normal. And so it's actually an age group in teens where we should check troponins, which. I think classically we thought of as more of an adult thing, but they're more likely to present with myocardial injury. So if for any reason you have that kind of high up on your differential, think about troponins and don't be too overly reassured by, you know, a normal blood pressure and pulse. And whereas a, a younger child with myocarditis may very well present with those classical symptoms that we learn about where their pulse is weaker, um, their blood pressure might be lower in teens, they really will unlikely present that, but yeah, in this setting, no, not that useful. Um, okay, so I think this was a <laughs> whirlwind all over the place, but of just some points that I wanted to get across and opens up a lot of conversations that I'm happy to have at any time.